Hello class, today we're going to be talking about George W. Bush. And it's always a little tricky when we're talking about people that are still alive and whose presidencies I was alive for and lived through. All right, so we're, we're going to try our best here. George W. Bush is one of two situations where we have a father-son president. We are a second president, John, Quin John Adams. And the sixth president is his son, John Quincy Adams. And we have George H.W. Bush and then his son, George W. Bush. So George W. Bush was born in 1946 a, uh, to a future president of the United States. And uh, he served stateside during Vietnam. And he, um, so he, he was in the United States military, but he did not see combat. His father remains the most recent president to have seen combat. Okay, and then he married his wife, Laura, in 1977. And they had twin daughters. So he is with a group of other men uh, that go together to be the uh, owners of the Texas Rangers. Now, the other thing that's occurring during this time, right, is that his dad is becoming famous, right? His dad ran twice for Senate, and he has all these different government jobs before he's vice president and then president of the United States. And uh, Bush ran for the House at one point during all this. It wasn't successful. But in 1994, he ran for governor of Texas and in a state that had been reliably for Democrats in state governance for most of its history, he defeated the incumbent Ann Richards. And then in 1998, he is reelected uh, by a large margin. He stays popular. So he, in 2000, he is commissioned to run for president um, and his main opponent is is John McCain. Okay. And so George W. Bush wins the Iowa caucus, okay, um, which basically McCain ignores uh, with 41% of the vote. But then McCain wins New Hampshire. So we have ourselves a race. But then Bush wins South Carolina, which basically sets him on track to become the Republican nominee. All right, so Bush gets the nomination. And he is going to pull from his father's administration, right? right? And he is going to have um, the uh, former secretary for his father, Dick Cheney, in charge of finding a running mate. And ultimately, the one that is chosen is Dick Cheney. And I say that Dick Cheney picked himself, but uh, it's a little more complicated than that. But if we're looking for the balancing of the ticket aspect here, right? Bush is younger, um, and he has experience in state government, and he's from the South, where Cheney is from Wyoming, he is older, he has a lot of experience in Washington, D.C. Okay, so people's basically question there, right? And so his opponent during, the, during this race is, is Al Gore, the sitting vice president. And it's gonna be a really close election, about as close as you can get, right? It's a, and it's a disputed election. I mean, ultimately, the result is that um, we have a bunch of very close states. The big one is Florida, which his brother's governor of, is won by a little over 500 votes. But there's a lot that are really close. New Mexico goes for Gore by only 300 some votes. Gore also wins Wisconsin, Iowa, Oregon, and Oregon by small amounts. New Hampshire. It decided by 7,000 votes for Bush, 
one of the people that Gore looked at as a running mate was the governor of New Hampshire. And if he had won New Hampshire, he would have become president. George W. Bush would not. So the big dispute, though, is in Florida about a recount. And this ends up going to the Supreme Court of the United States, which rules five to four in favor of Team Bush, ending the recount, making him president of the United States. Now, the reason that Florida is so important is that it allows George W. Bush to get 271 electoral votes, which is one above the minimum you need to become president of the United States. Right, so if it went to Gore, Gore would have been quite a bit above what was needed to become president. Um, so it goes there with this period of election. The other element of this is that Gore does win the popular vote, while George W. Bush wins the Electoral College. So there is this divide that you will see. So when Bush first comes in, okay, he is focused on some domestic issues. And when he's coming into office, the United States has balanced the budget and there's actually a surplus. So there's some debate in 2000 about what to do with that surplus. Should we be paying off the debt? What should we be doing? George W. Bush thinks that we shouldn't be taking more money from taxpayers than we're spending. So we do the Bush tax cuts, um, which get through Congress, that are going to lower the rates, and it shifts the brackets. So you can't see it in a completely straightforward manner. Uh, and so if you make more than $28,000 a year, you are going to see a tax cut, right? And it being larger if you are making more, right? So we see this between Reagan and Bush in these series of tax cuts, uh, basically a cut in half from the top marginal tax rate. Now it's going to do No Child Left Behind, which is trying to increase the standards of education in the United States. Now, what's weird is that the Constitution never mentions the word education. So it has been a, a power that has devolved to the states, which is why we have all these different state level programs for education. And so there has to be a carrot and stick approach from the national government in order to try to get things through. And there's lots of elements of No Child Left Behind, different grants that you can get for things. But one thing that ends up going pretty strongly through it is standardized testing. Right? That funding is linked to how your standardized testing results occur. And this gets eventually repealed and replaced with the Every Student Succeeds Act later on. So he originally wants to focus on domestic issues, but that's not going to be able to stay because August 6, 2001, in the Presidential Daily Brief, okay, this has been declassified, top line thing, Bin Laden determined to strike the United States. Right. So, Osama Bin Laden, Saudi Arabian businessman who had been involved in the um, Afghan resistance to the Soviets, uh, who had formed his own terrorist organization, done terrorist bombings other places internationally, is going to 9 11. And there are four planes that are going to be taken to use this attack. Right? We have the Twin Towers right, for the World Trade Center in New York. Two planes are going to hit these. We have the Pentagon which actually was celebrating its 60th anniversary of its groundbreaking um, on that day. And then another plane was supposed to go to Washington, D.C. It's not 100% clear whether it was going to go to the Capitol building or the White House. It does not make it there. So they're all hijacked. I'm not going to show any of the things because YouTube gets very touchy on 9-11 as a subject. They all get hijacked. Um, and um, 
hit their targets except for the delayed flight of United Airlines Flight 93. By this point, the people know about the terrorist attacks and they end up uh, storming the cockpit and it crashes into a field in Pennsylvania instead of its target. So what happens there, though, is that 3,000 people die. And when it starts out, Bush is reading a book to children in Florida because he's focusing on his literacy program. Right? So suddenly, he is essentially a wartime president, so to speak, right? And you have all these headlines around the world. And so the immediate reaction from Bush, though, is to create the TSA, in which there is an actual airport security that is standardized and required by the federal government everywhere. Right. Also going to be the creation of the Department, Department of Homeland Security with Tom Bridge as its first secretary. Okay. And then through Congress, the more controversial thing that gets passed is the Patriot Act, okay, which gives enormous powers to the federal government to possibly spy on its own people and not necessarily need warrants if they're fighting terrorism. So he becomes a international president. Okay, he went domestic, but he went international. So the war on terror, and this is a war on a concept. Right, and this is from a speech that Bush gives. We had this phrase war on terrorism, and this isn't the first time that we've seen this. We uh, had Lyndon Johnson declare a war on poverty. Richard Nixon declare a war on drugs. And George W. Bush declares a war on terror. It's an abstract concept. And so this results in the United States invading Afghanistan. And there's a lot of background here. But the terrorist organization that had done 9-11 is Al-Qaeda. Okay which are Islamic extremists. Now, a different set of Islamic extremists was in control of the government of Afghanistan called the Taliban. And the Taliban was harboring Al-Qaeda, specifically Assamdullah. And after the refusal, the United States invokes the article of NATO, and we get a bunch of other countries to help us invade Afghanistan. And so about a month after 9-11 terrorist attacks, we have the invasion of Afghanistan. And rather quickly, the, the Taliban government, it falls. Uh, but Osama bin Laden is going to manage to slip out of the country into Pakistan. And it will be under President Obama that we have to actually deal with taking him out. And there's lots of attempts to make democracy occur in Afghanistan. And we hold elections in which they elect their, their president. Um, but the issue is that the Taliban had emerged as an insurgency fighting the occupying Soviets. So they weren't very well prepared for a U.S. invasion for regular warfare. But once it's U.S. occupation, they're well set up and there's going to be an insurgency. The other thing that is going to occur is, two years later, Iraq. So Saddam Hussein had been, had been the dictator of Iraq. And he had invaded Kuwait during George H.W. Bush's presidency, and the U.S. had intervened an international coalition to get rid of, to stop this invasion, take him out of Kuwait. But Saddam Hussein was still there. Right? And so eventually the United States is going to intervene. Now, the United States has not declared war since the 1940s. What they do is presidents get authorizations for the use of military force. So in 2002, 
Bush basically asked for permission from Congress for the authority, if need be, for him to intervene in Iraq. Right? So sometimes people talk about an Iraq war vote. There wasn't ever a vote that said yes, no on Iraq, but there is some dispute here. So he's given the authority of it. And the Bush administration is going to use the justification of the possibility of weapons of mass destruction. Now, this is a broad term. And for most people, they hear weapons of mass destruction, they think nuclear weapons. And that is something Iraq did not have. But there is a broader terminology for weapons of mass destruction that include chemical and biological weapons. And those type of weapons were employed during the Iraq and Iran war. And Iraq did have some things like that left over. So there's no dispute that Saddam Hussein is a terrible guy, hurt his own people. But the premise of the invasion of Iraq was either based on deception or faulty information. But the United States invades Iraq. This time, this is more controversial. Basically, only the United Kingdom joins us in this fight. It's not the broader coalition. France notably says, says, says no. So we're able to pretty quickly, with a shock and awe campaign, take out the government. Um, in Iraq, and Bush gives a pretty famous mission accomplished speech. But Saddam Hussein is still in hiding, and so in December 2003, he is captured. They shave him to make sure they know who he is, and so he is captured, and he is put on trial by his own people, who do ultimately execute him. Now, we do attempt to set up um a democracy there and they do have like whole elections in iraq right? and all the stuff with the war terror is continuing after bush's presidency it just starts here so in the 2004 presidential election it's going to be between george w bush and john Kerry, and the main focal point is going to be about terrorism and the war in iraq and the war in afghanistan was publicly quite popular and Iraq is going to be more controversial. And so Bush has no one really challenging him. Right? Um, and so we have the for presidential election, um, John Kerry, the governor of uh, uh, Senator of Massachusetts, right? former lieutenant governor, is going to get this. And Kerry is a Vietnam war hero that turned anti-war activist in Vietnam. And he voted for the authorization for the use of force in Iraq, but then turned critic on it. So the dispute really becomes about the war in Iraq. Now, people become way more aware now about the importance of the Electoral College as the result of this because of the popular vote Electoral College split that we had back in 2000. So the map I found that have you know, a hand for every visit and dollar for amount spent, that there's a handful of states that are getting a lot of focus. And so ultimately, Bush wins. And so what happens is that Bush loses New Hampshire, flips to John Kerry, but then he picks up Iowa and um, New Mexico um, to his column. Right? So not much changes in the Electoral College. However, in the popular vote, Bush actually wins it. And so this means that uh, this is the only time in the past 30 years a Republican has won the popular vote for president. And you can see in this, though, when people are asked, what is the most important issue in the exit poll? Okay, if you put terrorism, moral values, or taxes, it went for Bush. Okay, so that's the first two heavily. If you put Iraq, education, healthcare, or the economy, you went heavily for Kerry. So, an interesting thing to look at the country is people concerned about the economy overwhelmingly are calling for his opponent. Right? But because there are questions about terrorism, right, 
and can will Bush keep us safe versus Kerry? Over Ryan thing, Bush gets reelected. And after Bush is reelected, uh, he gets the chance to appoint people to the Supreme Court. There were no vacancies during his first term. So he gets um, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court dies. So he gets to nominate John Roberts to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And John Roberts is still the Chief Justice on the Supreme Court. Um, he nominated Harriet Myers, um, who had been his personal lawyer in the past, uh, to replace Sandra Day O'Connor because it was a situation where a woman was retiring. He wanted to replace her with female justice. There was some criticism, so he withdrew her nomination and put in Samuel Alito, uh, who is more controversial but makes it through. He's still on the court today. So on Bush's thing, um, something that's going to drag him down in his second term is Hurricane Katrina. Okay, this massive hurricane that hits the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, uh, in late August, early September of 2005. And it really devastates the city of New Orleans. Right, whose levees break and it gets flooded. And there is a perception of a slow response by the federal government. Um, and an incident in which Kanye West speaking at a telethon, raising money for it, says on national TV, George Bush doesn't care about black people. And George W. Bush has said that that is the low point of his presidency. Okay, that, that that was what made him most upset was that accusation afterwards. Uh, but you can see this. Um, in 2006, it's the midterm elections. And the Democrats gain a bunch of governorships. They then retake the House and the Senate. And so for the last two years of Bush's presidency, he has to deal with a Democratic House and Senate. Okay. Um, so uh, people had turned against Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Katrina, these things were starting to build up. And so he has some of the weirdest approval, if you look at Gallup, where he was around 50% approval when he came into office, Shot up to 90% after 9-11. Okay, shot up to 70% after Iraq. And then it kept going down to getting all the way down to 25%. And part of the reason for that is in the last year of his presidency, the global economy crashes. And the global economy crashing is not necessarily uniquely the fault of George W. Bush. But we have a situation in which there was a housing bubble and the housing bubble burst, okay? Run by sub mortgage, prime mortgage crisis. So we have all these foreclosures. Then the banks, the stock market crash. The banks have to be bailed out during the end of his term, which means that his name is pretty toxic by the end of his presidency. And so, like, if you look at, like, the 2008 election, right, he can't run because he's term limited. Almost everywhere in the country shifts towards the Democrats. Democrats get large majorities in the House and the Senate. And Bush leaves at a pretty low point in his approval. Right? He gets a little bit of uptick at the end after, a, afterwards. And he's stayed pretty silent since the, his, his brother ran for president and he said some stuff when that was occurring. He attends the important things, the, the inaugurations and the funerals of, of other presidents and such, um, but he stayed pretty quiet. 
afterwards. Um, and he's someone who's controversial. Uh, no other way uh, to put it about. He has a divided, uh, a divided legacy. And it's hard to talk about some of the stuff is so recent. So one of the two examples we have of a father-son being president of the United States and, and the last Republican to win the popular vote. All right. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you have a good day.